1975, the average fuel consumption of cars within the US was around 15 miles per gallon or 15.6 liters per 100 kilometers. In 2019, most cars easily achieve 30 plus miles per gallon or 7.8 liters per 100 kilometers, with some even approaching 40 miles per gallon or 5.88 liters per 100 kilometers. And this was without factoring in hybrid technologies. The abrupt rise of fuel economy in the US was a direct result of a shift of fuel economy policy in 1975. This was in response to the oil price shocks of the early 1970s. This caused the transition towards smaller cars with less powerful, smaller engines. This trend was generally unappealing among consumers, and manufacturers took note of this and started exploring technologies that would bring power and robustness back to their vehicles while still maintaining good fuel economy. To understand how this was done, let's first look at how a gasoline engine works. It should be noted that the scope of this video will be limited to gasoline engines only, though some of the principles do overlap with diesel engines. An engine extracts energy from the burning of gasoline. It does this by first taking in a mixture of fuel and air into a cylinder. The total working volume of all of the cylinders in the engine is known as its displacement. It then compresses the mixture and ignites it with a spark plug. As the mixture burns, it expands, pushing down a piston, which rotates a crankshaft. The spent gases are then pushed out through the exhaust. Power is sent from the rotating crankshaft through the drivetrain, then to the wheels. Now to make a vehicle more fuel efficient, we need to reduce how much energy it takes to move around. The first step is to reduce the size of the vehicle. Less mass requires less energy to move. With less mass to move around, we can now reduce the size of the powertrain. A lower displacement engine with fewer cylinders and a smaller drivetrain not only weigh less, but also lose less energy getting power to the wheels. This is called parasitic loss and it's caused by the inherent mechanical inefficiencies of moving assemblies within the powertrain. The amount of fuel air mixture an engine can aspirate to create power is directly related to its displacement and number of cylinders. By reducing engine displacement size, you lower the amount of power an engine can make, but also the amount of fuel it consumes. Increasing power output but still keeping fuel efficiency required manufacturers to get clever. The first steps were to control the fuel usage of the engine more accurately. In order to do this, we need to understand when fuel is used most and why. Engines in cars have five modes of operation. Starting, idling, accelerating, cruising, and decelerating. Starting, idling, and decelerating all use relatively tiny amounts of fuel, so let's focus on acceleration and cruising. These two modes are where most fuel consumption occurs. From the engine's point of view, acceleration happens when more throttle is opened, allowing it to take in more air and fuel so that it can increase its rotational speed and power output. Throttling open an engine to make more power is where its highest fuel consumption occurs. Cruising, on the other hand, occurs when the throttle is held slightly open, keeping the engine's speed and power output steady. Because the goal is usually to maintain a constant vehicle speed, we only need the minimum amount of power output to accomplish this. This is where we can hone in the fuel efficiency of an engine. Most of the fuel that we use driving is caused by a combination of short bursts of acceleration and longer periods of cruising. The key to balancing power and fuel economy is having strong acceleration characteristics, but efficient cruising characteristics. An efficient cruising mode can offset the acceleration mode, making the engine more fuel efficient overall. The ideal ratio of air to gasoline is 14.7 to 1. This is known as a stoichiometric mixture, and in theory, this ratio will burn off the gasoline and extract the most amount of energy possible. But in practice, this ratio becomes difficult to achieve. This is because an engine only has a few milliseconds to vaporize and mix fuel with air before combustion. As it rotates faster, the available mixing time drops further. To compensate for this, more fuel is added, enriching it. This allows more fuel to be burnt without ideal mixing. Enriching is used primarily under acceleration to overcome decreasing mix times and ensure maximum power generation. But this comes with a significant penalty. Since we're mixing in more fuel than could ever possibly be burnt with a given amount of air, unburnt fuel is wasted. Getting the amount of enrichment just right is important to creating power with minimal fuel waste. Now, on the cruising end of the equation, we don't care about power beyond the minimum needed to maintain a certain speed. This is where we can maximize fuel economy. Since our power requirements are constant, relatively low, mixtures closer to 14.7 to 1 or even slightly higher are used. This is known as running lean since we're not utilizing all of the air in combustion. Running lean uses less fuel but can be damaging. Gasoline vapors by nature are very volatile. Within a cylinder compressed with air, it doesn't take much for the mixture to self-ignite. For an engine to function properly, ignition must be triggered by the spark plug at a very specific time in the cycle. 
Uncontrolled self-ignition of the mixture is called detonation and it can cause overheating and damage to the engine. To combat detonation, the chamber and spark plugs are designed to prevent hot spots that can trigger self-ignition. But even more importantly, incoming fuel is used to cool the combustion chamber and control the rate of burning, reducing the chances of detonation. Leaning out the mixture causes an abundance of oxygen in the combustion chamber, making it prone to fast, hot, erratic burning, increasing the risk of self-ignition. This limits how lean we can actually run an engine. The common factor for both power and good fuel economy is in precise fuel metering. Up until the 1980s, most cars relied on carburetors to meter out fuel. Carburetors work by drawing in fuel as air is ingested into the engine via the Venturi effect. Regulated by the throttle, the flow of air and throttle position determine how much fuel is drawn in. The correct amount of fuel for the airflow is metered by flow-restricting nozzles called jets, with different jet circuits being tuned to different modes of an engine's operation. Because of its mechanical nature, carburetors lack precise control over air-fuel mixture and require maintenance to keep them functioning correctly. With the rise of cheaper embedded electronics and stricter efficiency and emissions requirements, electronic fuel injection was embraced by manufacturers. Fuel injection works by precisely spraying pressurized fuel through computer-controlled injectors. Fuel is sprayed into the intake of the engine just before it enters the cylinder. The computer that meters out fuel is known as an engine control unit or ECU. Its job is to measure the state of the engine using sensors and calculate the right amount of fuel to use for conditions. Some of the key parameters measured are engine RPM, air temperature, air flow into the engine, throttle position, and engine temperature. Armed with the accuracy of digital electronics and the flexibility of software, manufacturers now could tune fuel systems much closer to the ideal for both power and fuel economy. Because fuel injection is sprayed at higher pressures, it atomizes and mixes better with air. It can also be sprayed into the turbulent region of intake flow, enhancing mixing even further. Better air-fuel mixing requires less enrichment overall and improves both fuel economy and power. On most engines, the fuel injection system and the ignition system are merged. This allows the ECU to adjust the ignition point timing relative to the combustion cycle. Creating a spark earlier in the cylinder or advancing the timing can produce more power by starting combustion sooner. This allows more pressure to be produced in the combustion, but at the risk of detonation. With an ECU in control of the ignition system, advancing ignition timing when conditions allow for it now become possible. Another advantage of fuel injection is that it allows for the use of feedback in the fuel delivery system. During cruising, the leanness of combustion is monitored by an oxygen sensor in the exhaust stream, providing feedback to the ECU. The ECU can use this data to trim the air-fuel mixture closer to ideal, boosting fuel economy. This type of monitoring also allows adjustments to be made for improving the emissions-reducing properties of catalytic converters. Sensors to detect detonation are also present on some fuel injection systems. Early sensors work by listening for the acoustical signatures of detonation on the engine block. Being able to detect detonation lets manufacturers tune engines even leaner for better fuel economy. If detonation is detected, the mixture can be enriched and the ignition timing adjusted to reduce detonation. By the early 1990s, fuel injection became the standard of the automotive industry. Manufacturers would soon start looking at other parts of the engine, as well as further evolving fuel injection to meet the diverging requirements of more power, but better fuel economy. In the second video on this topic, we'll take a look at some of these technologies, such as variable valve timing, cam phasing, high compression engine design, and small engine turbocharging. We'll also take a look at how manufacturers have evolved fuel injection by making use of some advanced techniques such as direct injection and ionic ignition sensing.